Praise the Lord. We may have our seats. Um, uh, once again, I definitely want to thank Dr. Hepburn for this opportunity. Thank the church. Um, you know, throughout the whole day, I was just reminiscing on yesterday and just how humble I was just to see how receptive you all were to, to the information, how people have already started to apply um, what I said yesterday. You know, one of the things that I said was the 80-20 rule. And do, the whole goal is you do whatever it takes to be part of that 20%. And the, the amount of people that have started to take action is just overwhelming. And even messages that Dr. Hepburn has received is really humbling. You know, and I want to thank you all for taking the time out to come out this evening as well. And I'm certainly sure that you all will be blessed tonight. Amen? Amen. Um, and if you haven't already done so, um, you know, unfortunately, I don't have any more of these books left because I only brought a few copies, but I think there's still two different copies, um, two different books left. I think it's the 21 Habits of Highly Broke People and How Poor People Think. Uh, I want to encourage you to get the books because most of the things that I talk about are all covered in the books plus more, right? So, you know, once you get a chance, definitely feel free to do that, all right? So yesterday was more of the mindset, and I think it was very important to talk about the mindset because if the foundation is right, everything that you build on it will also be right. Does that make sense? Okay. So today is more so getting in depth into, you know, how to start making things happen, right? While tomorrow will be more about how do you generate other streams of income in addition to whatever you currently have now, all right? Um, now, in, in talking about when starting off the session, I'm going to be diving into uh, the different type, the laws of wealth, all right? And when you talk about laws, um, laws and principles don't change, all right? Uh, so I'll give you an example. When you talk about the law of gravity, all right, whether you are in Florida or you're in Maryland or whether you're in the United States or you are in Asia, wherever you are if you apply, the, the law of gravity applies all over the place. Does that make sense? Right? If you jump off, the, off of a cliff, what's going to happen? You're falling to the ground. Right? It is a law. It's a principle. It doesn't change. It's constant. Same thing applies when you talk about laws of wealth. They don't change. So anybody can apply these laws irrespective of their race, their religion, their gender. It really doesn't matter. All right, and that's why I'm going to share with you these laws to help you understand how important they are, but more importantly, why you need to take them seriously. Amen. Now, there are plethora of laws, right? Plethora of laws that I can talk about, but in order for me to be able to drill or drive home these points, I'm only going to be focusing on three laws tonight. But these three laws are so basic, but yet powerful at the same time. As a matter of fact, if you apply these three laws in your life consistently over time, your finances will change drastically. Amen? All right? And if you've been breaking these laws, the whole essence of this evening session is to help you to get to a point where you start applying them in your life and also educating your children and those around you so that way they can also prosper. Amen? So the first law of wealth that we're looking at tonight is the law of spending less or spend less than you earn, okay? Spending less money than you earn. It's a very simple and basic law. But when you look at most people, especially in the United States, because we are a consuming society, all right? And any time, you know, you have a consuming society, that means people are more prone to constantly spend and spend and spend, all right? But when you have a producing society, people spend less and they produce more, and that's how you create wealth. Now, in talking about spending less than you earn, Dave Ramsey says something very important, all right? How many of you know Dave Ramsey? Excellent. He said financial peace isn't the acquisition of stuff. It's learning to live on less than you make so you, can give, uh, so you can give money back and have money to invest. You can't win until you do this. So regardless of 
how wealthy you want to be, how much money you want to earn, if a person is constantly putting out more money than they're bringing in, they're far from financial freedom, okay? Now, one of the things that I believe is that most people don't have money problems. You know, if I was to ask you, do you have, you know, if I were to ask people, do you have financial problems, most people would probably say, yes, I'm not making enough, I have too many bills, I'm just getting by, but for most, that's not the issue, okay? The issue is a lot of people are not disciplined with their finances, all right? And when you're not disciplined with your finances, you will be disciplined by your finance, all right? So here's a, according to a recent survey, and these are start, startling uh, survey or results, it says only 59% of adults say they have savings account. The average American household carries $16,000 in credit card debt. What do you think most people spend their credit, card, uh, credit cards on? Bills, shopping, right? If you look at it, most people aren't using their credit cards for investment purposes. They're not using their credit cards for opportunities, they're using their credit cards to supplement their lifestyle, right? There was a study that was done, and I, I can't remember at the top of my head. Financial institutions have all of us broken down into two categories, right? You have, they, they actually, type, uh, I guess, coined these phrases, revolvers, and uh, what's the second one? I'm skipping my mind right now. Um, I can't remember, but basically two categories of people. The first category of people are people that they identify who always use their credit card, but they actually pay the minimum. The second group that they've identified are people who use their credit cards, but they pay it off every month. Who do you think they target the most? The people who pay the minimum. The reason is because once they hook you on paying the, on that credit card, they know that you will always pay the minimum, and the longer, the longer you stretch it out, the more likely you are to pay interest probably three times more than what, the, what, you, uh, what your debt is. It's a study. This is, it's already proven, okay? So if you're constantly in a situation where you're, you're using credit card, you're paying the minimum, they, they got you exactly where they want you. And here's, what, here's how they even hook you more. Once they give you a credit limit of, say, $2,000, and they notice you're consistent with the minimum payment, what do you think they'll do next? They increase it. Because they know that the more, uh, the more uh, uh, access you have, the more you'll do what? The more you'll spend. So people are constantly falling into these traps. That's how they get college students. So an average college student will graduate with credit card that they would never, ever pay off in their lifetime, right, because of the word discipline. And, I, you know, I think I was talking to Deacon JB on our way up here. I said, you know, it's not that credit card is bad, but people who are not disciplined financially should not be using credit cards. If you can't afford to get a credit card, use it, and then pay it off within 30 days, you're not in the category of people that should be using credit cards. Amen? It says 44% said they could not cover an unexpected expense of $400. And here's what's baffling the most. Most people have spent at minimum five years working. Some 10 years, some 20 years, some 30 years. But they cannot put their hands on $1,000. Am I making sense? Right? And I want you to think deep about that. That if most people can spend all this time working, but there's nothing to show for it, then what exactly have they been spending their money on? All right? And this is very bad. This is very bad. And then it says nearly half of adult Americans are currently living paycheck to paycheck. You know, the whole essence of this seminar or this presentation is to get us to a point where we don't fall into any of these categories, right? You may, you may be in here because you didn't know, but now that we know, and I'm going to be sharing with you steps that you can take to become financially free, 
And if you take them, you're going to see the results that you desire. But I want to share, I just wanted to show this so you know where most Americans fall. And the single factor that kind of puts people in here is that word discipline. Amen? All right. So um, another important point is that you can never be financially free if you spend more than you earn or you are entangled in debt. All right? To me, debt is a demon. All right? Debt is, to me, debt is a demon. It's a devil because once, once it holds you, most people don't get out. It's a stronghold. You know, we read about stronghold in the Bible. A stronghold is something that's way more stronger and powerful than you are. That you need an external force to be able to break that. Right? From a spiritual standpoint, that's the blood of Jesus. Okay? Now, the blood of Jesus works in all things, but the blood of Jesus is not going to get you debt free. Right, because you got yourself in the debt based on your habits and your financial disciplines, right? But the Bible gives us principles that we can apply to help us become debt free. All right. So, of course, I said this yesterday, Proverbs twenty-two verse seven, that the rich rules over the poor and the borrower is a slave to the lender. Now we might think, you know, lender is maybe, I, you know, I ask you to borrow me a few dollars, you borrow me some money, then you know, I'm your slave, quote unquote. But when you look at the word lender, it could be anything. Your car note, whoever you pay your car note to, that is a lender. Whoever you pay your mortgage to, that is a lender. All right, whoever you're paying anything to, that is a lender. Now I'm not saying that all debts are bad, but I'm just saying that your goal. Is to be debt free. All right? There is nothing like waking up every day and you choosing whether or not you're going to go to work today. There's nothing better than waking up every day knowing that you don't owe any man anything except love. Right? But to get to that point, it requires financial discipline. It requires you learning what you haven't, you've never learned before so you can become who you've never uh, been before. All right? So your number one priority is to get out of debt and stay out of debt. That's, from this point on, that should be your number one priority. Remember, I'm laying these foundations because you can't really skip from, you know, number one, having the wrong mindset to wanting to just build wealth. And you can't skip from having the wrong mindset to, you know, being in debt and they say you want to build wealth. You got to make sure that each level is taken care of before you get to the point of building wealth. And the, the second point, uh, well, the, the number one priority is you have to be debt free. All right. You have to be debt. Free. You cannot build wealth if you are in debt. You cannot have financial peace if you are in debt. You cannot truly serve God the way you want to if you are in debt. All right? So today's debt is robbing you of your future wealth. Because every single dollar you're using to pay off debt today is money that you could have used to invest to secure your future. And that's why whatever you got to do, you have to run this race to get out of debt as fast as possible, all right? So it's better to pay off a debt that you're paying 15 to 25% interest on annually than to invest in something that's only yielding 5 to 10%, all right? I heard Warren Buffett say something like this, and the thing just stuck with me. He said, look, a lot of people want to invest. They want to know, how can I make more money? But what is the essence of you making more money Maybe you're only 10%, whatever the case is, but then you have an outstanding debt that they're charging you 15, 20. I think credit cards are like even up to 30% now. And most people don't even pay attention to that. They just focus on the minimum payment. As long as I do the minimum, I'm good. But minimum is keeping you at a, at a place that you don't want to be, right? If you look at all the interest that you've probably paid on your credit cards, interest you've probably played on other loans and things like that, you'll be amazed as to how much money you're throwing away. 
all right? And that is why I emphasize to people that, look, instead of, you know, it's okay to want to be wealthy, but you cannot skip being debt-free. There's certain debts you might have for a longer period of time, maybe like your mortgage, okay? Maybe sometimes your car note. But outside of those two things, credit card is a demon that you have to release yourself from. Amen? Amen. Everybody feeling me so far? Yes. Say, deep while I feel you. Deep I, feel you. Right, I love it. All right. So gain control over your money, and the way to do this is to track your expenses for the next 30 days. So this is my second assignment to you, all right? For the next 30 days, well, let me, let me backtrack for a second. Raise your hand if you know exactly how much money you bring in every month, all right? About 90% of the people, okay? Now, raise your hand if you know exactly how much you're spending and what you're spending your money on. Right? Not so much hands. We know how much is coming in. Some of us may know how much we're spending, but you may not know what exactly you're spending your money on. And that's where the dangerous part is. So one of the things that I teach people is on your journey to actually building wealth, you got to be able to track what you're doing, what you're doing with your money. Because if you don't know where your money is going, then you, the chances are you're probably wasting money on things that are, are, are want versus needs, all right? So in the next 30 days, here's my assignment to you. I want you to write down, or even there are apps that you can use for this, okay? Starting from tonight, I want you to write down everything that you spend money on, even if it's a penny. Do you know what will happen in 30 days if you do that? Anybody? You spend less, yeah. Why? You're aware of what you're spending money on, and then what else? You'll, you'll identify your needs versus your want. Because right now, we're, people just spend money because, oh, I, I, need to, I need to go out to eat. I need happy hour. I need to buy new shoes. I need to buy new clothes. But we don't really need to do any of those things. But when you start looking at what you spend your money on habitually every month, maybe you purchase a cup of coffee every time you're going to work. And now it's a need. I mean, it's habitual now. And you realize that in 30 days, you spent $150 on a cup of coffee. All right? That's just one thing. But you won't know that until you actually start writing down everything you're spending your money on. And you will be amazed as to how much money you can start saving when you, when you realize where your money is going. Amen? So that's my assignment for everyone for the next 30 days. And once you do that, you'll be able to cut what I call excess spending. All right? So... We're moving into the second law. Remember, I'm sharing, I'm sharing three laws with you. The third law is where I'm going to spend most of my time on. Uh, the second law is the law of saving a portion of your income. All right? Saving a portion of your income. Like I said, these are very basic things. And, I, man, you're probably thinking deeper. These are basic. I want to hear something, like, something deep. Right? How many of you want to hear something deep? This is deep? Okay, all right. Now I feel a little bit. I feel a little bit better, right? Saving a portion of your income, as simple as it sounds, most people don't know what it means to save money. Mo when I say most, I mean you saw the survey earlier, okay? That people are constantly spending money. Most people can't put their hands on four hundred dollars if an expense were to occur. So now. If they can't put their hands on $400, if an, emer if an emergency were to occur, where do you think they go next to get the money? Credit cards. Credit cards. It's, it's a vicious cycle. So if you don't understand these laws, you'll realize that credit cards, borrowing money, becomes your default. And if that's your default, you can never, ever become financially free because you don't have a system in place, all right? So Jack Benny said, try to save something while your salary is small. It's impossible to save after you begin to earn more. 
Why do you think this is true? Huh? Say that one more time. The Bible? Okay, yeah, the Bible. All right. If you're faithful in little, you'd be faithful in much. Yep, absolutely. Somebody else has something? Say that one more time. The more you earn, the more you spend. Absolutely. But here's the key, right? If you cannot cultivate the habit of saving $10 when you're earning $100, you're not going to save $100 when you're earning $1,000. If you cannot cultivate the habit of saving a thousand dollars when you're earning a hundred thousand or whatever the case is there is no way when you start earning more money you start saving it's a habit these are principles these are laws so whatever amount of money you're making right now i don't care what it is if you're earning ten thousand dollars a year you should be able to save 50 cents because we're not after how much money you're saving what are we after the habit, the mentality. Because here's what happens. When you start to save and you notice that, look, you have something that's growing somewhere, subconsciously, you want to find more ways to make sure that thing continues to grow. So the excuse that people often give me is that I'm not making enough money. I don't, I don't really buy that from anybody. Because I tell you, look, regardless of what you're making, start saving a dollar. Can you, can you do that? Right? If you're, if you're hoping that after I pay my bills, I'll be able to save, you will never in your life be able to save. Because bills are not going anywhere. Bills are not going anywhere. It will always be with us. It will always be amongst us. Okay? But your goal is to make sure that you prioritize your savings. Okay, and here's my, uh, my second point. If you can't afford to save, reduce your liabilities or, and get out of debt. And this is where you're talking about tracking your expenses comes into play. Okay, because most people often tell me, well, Depot, I just don't, I'm just not making enough. But then when we look at their expenses, you can see little things, right? The Bible says that it's the little foxes that spoil the vineyards. You can see the little foxes. That they're spending money on every day. I'm like, hey, what about this one? Oh, yeah, I don't really need that. Okay? If you can't save money, you don't need a cable in your house. What are you being entertained for? All right? You, you don't. Like, when I started my journey, when I made up my mind that I wanted to be rich and wealthy, I became extremely rugged. And that's why, like, being wealthy is not a child's play. It's not about praying and fasting and speak, speaking in tongues. Those are great spiritual exercises, but you're going to be broke if that's all you do, right? When I wanted to become financially free, I remember, look, I, I remember getting rid of the internet in my house. I was that serious because my wife only used a cell phone. She doesn't use the computer. She was just always on her phone. I was at work most of the time, so I got to use the work computer, so I figured if I'm going to be using the internet, well, I, number one, I got my phone. Number two, I'm at work most of the time. I can use my work internet. So that was the kind of mindset that I had. Like, I, I wanted to be financially free. So when you want to be financially free, like, you cannot negotiate on things that you think you need versus things, you, things that you think you want. Right? I remember I read um, my first book that I, well, not my first, I read Dave Ramsey's book, um, Total Money Makeover. Just got out of college, so I'm talking about being rugged, rugged. So got out of college, got my first job, didn't really have any debt, no credit card debt, and I figured, man, I can afford a brand new car. That was a graduated from college, 2008. Bought a Camry, 2009 version, had two miles on it. I was paying $406 for the car note, 200 and something dollars for the insurance. And then one day, I just picked up a Dave Ramsey book. I was at work. I picked up the book, and I couldn't put it down until the entire day. So I finished reading the entire book, and I saw how important it was to be debt-free. So I said, listen, number one, I'm paying $600 and something dollars for something that's depreciating 
every month, every matter of fact, depreciating from the day I took it out of the lot. I drove the Camry back to Toyota dealership, and I said, man, I want to return the car. Well, they said, well, you got to pay us $2,000 to return the car back. So I, I literally wrote out a check, and I gave them $2,000 so that I can be debt free. Because I figured if I paid off the car, I gave back the car, I don't need to look fly. I wanted to be financially free. Right? So instantly, I started saving $650. Multiply $650 times 12 and subtract $2,000. Right? So when we talk about the journey of being financially free, you have to be extremely rugged. Whatever excess you need to cut off, whatever you need to get rid of so that you can break free from that chain, you're willing to do it. And you're not negotiating. You're not trying to keep up with the Joneses. How many of you ever met the Joneses? Never. We don't know who they are. The Joneses are trying to keep up with the Joneses. Because we've never met them. But we live in a world where we feel like we have to constantly try to impress people um, or look a certain way, drive a certain car so people can think we got it even though we don't have it. That mindset, that mentality I talked about yesterday, got to change. And that's when, like, my journey literally started to being financially free. So now I spend less, I don't really care about material things. I have them, but I'm focusing more on investing and building generational wealth, right? But the key, you got to be debt free, all right? So, of course, I love giving biblical case study, right? Why do you need to save money? Why is it important to save a portion of your income? Well, we're going to look at a case study tonight, and it's coming from Genesis chapter 1, uh, chapter 41. Now, this case study is the story of Pharaoh. Pharaoh, um, how many of you guys knew that, uh, about the story, I mean, the dream that Pharaoh had, all right? Pharaoh had a dream. All right? And his dream were, was very uh, intense because nobody knew how to uh, interpret the dream. All right? So this is the easy-to-read version just to make it a little bit more plainer. It said, two years later, Pharaoh dreamed that he was standing by the Nile River. In the dream, seven cows came out of the river and stood there eating the grass. They were, they were healthy, good-looking cows. Then seven more cows came out of the river and stood on the bank of the river by the healthy cows. But these cows were thin and looked sick. The seven sick cows ate the seven healthy cows. Their Pharaoh woke up. This is where he became very uh, distressed. Not only because he couldn't interpret the dream, but all the astrologers, all the magicians in Egypt, none of them could interpret the dream, all right? Until this butler remembered how Joseph interpreted his dream, the whole nine yards, and now they got Joseph on the, on the scene. Well, Joseph, tell us about this dream. So Genesis 41, 25 to 31, and Joseph said to Pharaoh, both of these dreams have the same meaning. God is telling you, what will happen soon, all right? So essentially, like, I'm telling you the reason why you need to start saving because there are things that are happening in our economy. And if you're not prepared, the outcome of what happened to these guys is what's going to happen to a lot of people, all right? So it, God is sending me to somebody to get you to, to a point where you start taking your finances seriously, Amen. So it says, the seven good cows and the seven good heads of grain are seven good years. And the seven thin, sick-looking cows and the seven thin heads of grain means, mean that there will be seven years of hunger in this area. These seven bad years will come after seven good years. For the seven years, there will be plenty of food in Egypt, but then there will be seven years of hunger. The people will forget how much food there had been in Egypt before. This famine will ruin the country. So to kind of interchange the word famine, just replace famine with what we know today as recession. Everybody know what a recession means, right? 
Um, so essentially, what, what was going on is that God was telling Pharaoh, and he repeated a dream twice to let him know, I mean business, that a recession is coming. Now, I understand the economy has been booming for the last 10 years. Everything has been good, stock prices, crypto, real estate, everything has been booming for all these years. But God said, hold on. A recession is coming, and I need my people to be ready. Now, listen to what Joseph told him, all right? So Pharaoh said, so Pharaoh, you should choose a wise, intelligent man and put him in charge of Egypt. Then you should choose other men to collect food from the people. During the seven good years when everything is good, the land is prospering, there are no hiccups anywhere, the people must give them one-fifth of all the food they produce. One-fifth is 25%. So in other words, during these good times when everybody got good jobs, you're getting high salary, everything is good, you know, your investments are doing well, you're making good monthly income, God said, look, while everything is good, make sure you're not eating all your seeds. Make sure you're not spending all your paycheck on wants. That no matter what happens in these next seven years, make sure you're saving 25% of everything that comes in. Okay. So in this way, Unless, uh, uh, in this way, these men will collect all the food during the seven years, seven good years, and store it in the cities until it is needed. In other words, the money that you are saving, there's going to come a time where there will be opportunity. An opportunity will arise, and it's going to require you to have money to invest, money to do something. But you got to save 25%. Somebody say save 25%. 25%. All right? Okay, and it says, and then Egypt will not be destroyed by the famine. Now, if you read further into the, um, the story, you'll realize that it got to a point when the seven years came, everything was good, and then the seven years passed. When the seven years passed, the Bible stated that it was a point where nobody in Egypt had any grains, no food. People from Canaan, they were all coming to Egypt to get food from Pharaoh. And here's what happened. This is, I think, to me, this is one of the biggest wealth transfer in the Old Testament. Not only did people spend all their money to get grain from Pharaoh, they sold their cattle. Not only did they sell their cattle, they sold uh, their lands. Not only did they sell their lands, they sold themselves. Because to me, they were not really adequately prepared for the seven years of famine. So my question to you today is, all right, everything is good. I don't know how much you're earning. I don't know what your income looks like. But if a recession were to take place today, are you ready? Is your bank account ready? So in other words, what you do with your income now or what you're doing with your money right now will determine how well you'll be able to stand when turmoil comes. Because believe me, I'm going to tell you right, because this is what I do. The United States is not in a good place right now, globally, financially. Right? They're, they're tugging now trying to raise the debt ceiling. And if you know what that means, that means we've already spent all the money that we're supposed to, and we, we've really reached the ceiling. So now you got to open up the ceiling so I can get through because I need to go in more debt as a nation. So we have to be, so for me, I tell people that my economy is not based on like what's going on in the United States. Right? And your economy shouldn't be either. But for it to be that, for it to be that way, you need to make sure that financially you're prepared. And you cannot afford at this critical time to just use your money anyhow, waste your resources on wants versus needs. Amen. Everybody getting it? 
Awesome. All right? So, on the journey of understanding this law of saving a portion of your income, here's my belief. You pay yourself first and you pay your bill last. Somebody say, pay yourself first. Pay, yourself first. pay, your, bills pay your bills last. Now, the first time I did a video on this and I put on social media, went viral, and I started getting backslash. Everybody started attacking me. And everybody that attacked me, I, I, when I look at that page, I was like, well, I don't need to argue with this person because they, they will never get it. All right? And most people probably won't get it because people will rationalize, well, if I don't pay my bills, they won't kick me out of the house. If I don't pay my bills, they won't cut my phone off. Well, let me ask you a question. Raise your hand if you work a job. You have a source of income. All right? Um, raise your hand if you know how much taxes they take out of your paycheck. All right? All right? Um, raise your hand if you depend on the taxes they take out of your paycheck or what's left. Let me say that again for those of you who got the hands up. Raise your hand if you depend. So let's say you make $1,000 and the government takes two fifty. I want you to raise your hand if you depend on the two fifty they take out or the seven fifty that's left. Which one? What's left? So what that tells me that if the government can go into your paycheck before you touch it and you don't complain, right? You don't even think about it. My, most people say, yeah, I know how much money come out of my pay. Most people don't because you don't think about it. The only thing you're worried about is how much am I getting? That, that's all you're worried about. So if the government can do that forcefully, why can't you forcefully take money out of your own paycheck to secure your future and live off of what's left? All right. Now, for, this will debunk anybody that says, I'm not making enough money. Because you're not making enough, but the government still takes their cut. So if, when you understand this principle... That you got to find a way to pay yourself first. Once that paycheck hits, the first person that deserves to get paid, now I'll, I'll get the tithe in a bit, so don't think I, I forgot about that. But the first person that deserves to get paid before any bills gets paid is you. Because who did the work? You did the work. So most people spend all their lives running and trying to catch up to paying bills and paying bills, and they forget that, listen, in order for me to secure my future, I got to put things in place irrespective of bills that I have. And once again, some of the bills that most people have, they're just things that they choose to have, not necessarily things that they should have. You know, but once again, I'll let you do that. I've already given you the assignment so you can figure that out, all right? So listen to, look at the last point. When you pay yourself first, your lifestyle automatically adjusts to whatever is left over, just like taxes. So you might make $6,000 a year, I mean a month, but once the government take their money, you're, you're adjusting your life to what's left. So I want you to start seeing yourself as a very important bill that you need to pay every single time you get paid. Somebody say, I am a bill. Say, I am a bill, all right? Who is, what is the most important bill you should be paying every month? Me. Yourself. When you start seeing yourself as a bill, it changes the whole game, right? It changes the whole game. Your, your T-Mobile can wait. I don't know what you guys use in Florida, but they can wait. They're not going anywhere. Your car note is not going anywhere. But you have to figure out a way to prioritize your paying yourself first. So here's a rule that I use is the 70, 10, 10, 10 rule, okay? So 70% of your income goes towards your bills. 10% goes towards investing. So that's your financial freedom, all right? The mistake that most people make is that they have only one savings account. So you know what happens? When emergency comes, what do they do? They go to that, they go to that and they deplete it and then they start all over again. But when another emergency happens, they're depleted. So they're constantly running the rat race. 
But you need to have a strategy for your money. All right? You have 70% for your bills, 10% for investing, 10% for giving, which is tithing, right? And then you have 10% for emergency, unexpected events. Now, just in case you may not be able to do this based on where you are financially, it doesn't have to be 70, 10, 10, 10. It can be, I don't know, 90, and then you do 3, 3, 4, whatever the case is. But you have to allocate money in this order so that way you can be prepared for different events of life. All right, And then tomorrow, it's going to be more focused on how do you increase your income, some business ideas and other things you can do to generate additional stream of income. Amen? Does this make sense to everybody? Okay, great. All right, so how do you automate your savings? So if you don't have any savings right now, the chances are it's not automated. And whatever's not automated doesn't get done. So the easiest way of what works for me and most people is that you want to set up a separate bank account that you don't have easy access to, right? A separate bank account that you don't have the debit card in your wallet, amen? And then you set up a direct deposit from your paycheck to go into that account no matter how small the money is, all right? Just set it up, and once it goes, it's out of mind, out of sight. As long as you're not seeing it, you're not thinking about it. And that money continues to grow over time. And finally, never spend your savings on liabilities, not even your bills. No matter what happens, never touch your savings for anything, for family member, for relative, for whoever. Right? Because the moment you start doing that, you, you're starting back at square zero. So personally, my savings, like, I don't even keep my money in the bank. And I talk about one of my strategies later on. Like, you can have all the emergency you want. Once, let me see. Uh, once this money right here is depleted, and this is my philosophy. So this is how I break my money down. This 10% right here, this is my giving money. This is what I used to bless people. Like, oh, somebody needs help. I got you. If I have $1,000 in my giving money for the month, and that money is gone for the month of May. I don't care what kind of emergency somebody got. I'm not touching the rest of the 90. It's, it's a principle. You have to have principles, right? And once that money is gone, like, man, I'm sorry, you got to wait till next month. But you, you, you know what I realized? Number one, we're not the savior. People continue to come back to you once they feel like you got it, Right? I some, magically, I don't know how this happens, but the moment you tell somebody you won't got it, do you realize somehow, some way, they find a way to solve their own problems? It, it just miraculously happens. So sometimes I even play with people like, uh, all right, you need, you need what, $100? All right, um, get back to me on Friday. Right? I need a hundred dollars like right now, man. Man, it's a do or die, man. Um, just get back to me on Friday. They don't, they don't ever come back. Because they find a way to solve their own problems. And the moment you get into that mindset that look, you're not the savior. You're not going to deliver somebody from, from poverty. You're not going to deliver somebody from debt. That's going to re reduce your headache drastically. Right? Just because I got money doesn't mean I have to give it to you. It's my money. Right? And if I tell you that I don't have money, it's the truth. I don't have money for you. <laughs> right? Because I, look, look, I got the breakdown right here, right? So the money that I have allocated to give people is right here, 10%. And if I tell you I ain't got it, it just means that I've depleted that. The, the rest of the 90, that's, that's none of your business. Right? It's none of your business. So you got to have structure in your money so that way you don't feel obligated to help everybody. Amen? Okay. So here's some just basic ways you can leverage your money. Like I said, I don't keep money in a bank except for transactional purposes. Right? I understand the banking system. I, and I'm going to show you a few things um, in a couple, a couple of minutes here. As much as possible... Don't leave, like, lump sum of money just chilling in a bank. 
believe me when I tell you, right? So here are just basic or different avenues or different places that you can use to actually earn better APY on your money versus leaving it inside of a bank. And you have equal and easier, easy access just the same way you would in your bank. Right, this the Apple cards, right? They actually just launched it, I think, maybe a month ago. Where if you have an Apple, uh, I think it's one of their credit cards, you can actually use it as a savings account and transfer your money there. You're earning 4.5 percent, 4.15 percent APY on your money versus leaving the same money in your bank and you're not earning anything, right? And that's why a lot of banks are folding up because. People are starting to see that, number one, the banking system is not designed for us to succeed, right? It's not designed for customers. It's, the, it's designed for them to make money. They're not in business so that we can become wealthy. All banks, they are in business so that they can actually make a profit, right? And I'm going to show you that in a second. So please make sure you check these out. Um, I've tried two of them. So Apple Cards... Um, I just got their card in the mail maybe like uh, three weeks ago. And then Credit Karma, that's what I use to check my credit score. All right? So anytime there's a change on my credit report, I look at it. And then I noticed like two weeks ago that they're also offering 4.1% APY on your money. So I just wanted to test it out. And I just moved $100 in there just to set it up because I like to test things. Right? So please make sure you take advantage of these things. These are, these are avenues that you can get money out of your site because it's not in your bank account. And if it's not in your bank account, you're not going to easily spend it. Okay. Everybody got this? Okay. All right. So the third law, all right, and this is where I'm going to spend the rest of the night on, is the law of investing a portion of your income. All right. Investing a portion of your income. So everything that I've talked about yesterday, the first law, spending less than you earn. The second law, saving a portion of your income all leads to this one point. That no matter what you do, no matter how much money you have in your savings account, if you are not an investor, if you are not investing your money on a consistent basis, regardless of your age, all right? And I said regardless of your age because if you are a parent, you can actually open a custodial account for your kids where you're putting $10, $50 every month. And think about, when I'm going to talk about compound interest in a second, think about investing $50 to $100 for your kids every month and what that will be by the time they turn 30. I mean, it's ridiculous, right? So invest in a portion of your income. Here's what Robert Kiyosaki had to say and I love quotes, by the way. It says, the philosophy of the rich and the poor is this. The rich invest their money and spend what is left, and the poor spend their money and invest what is left. But here's the problem with the second part. Usually, well, who can answer that for me? What's the problem with the second part? <laughs> There's never nothing left. Right? Almost never nothing left. So you can see why I said before that if, you're, you're, if you want to become wealthy or at least become financially free, you, you have to pay yourself first. If not, you will never, ever, ever have anything left. Right? So um, raise your hand if you're familiar with this, the cash flow quadrant. One, two, three, somewhat. Okay, perfect. So this is good. New information. So... The cash flow quadrant is or was designed by Robert Kiyosaki, all right? Robert Kiyosaki is a financial expert business guru, and he says basically that every single person on this planet falls into one of these categories. The first quadrant is the E quadrant, which is the employee, all right? Meaning that in order for you to make money, you have to physically Go to work and trade time for dollars. So if you don't show up to work, you don't make any money. It doesn't matter if you're a six-figure earner, you're making $1,000, you're making $100,000 a year, a million dollars a year. If you don't go in from nine to five, you are not going to get paid. 
that is not the quadrant that most people who want to create wealth should be in. All right? That is the E quadrant, the employee quadrant. The second quadrant is self-employed quadrant, the S quadrant. Similar to the E quadrant, but a little bit different in the sense that you own a job. Okay? So these are, when you talk about your physician, your lawyers, they, they own their own, uh, their own firm, the whole nine yards. They're making a lot of money, but once again, if they don't go to their office, if they don't perform a task, they're not going to get paid. All right? So, there's, like I said, you're trading time for dollars. The third quadrant is the B quadrant, which is the business owner. So, in other words, you own a system and people work for you. So, his whole philosophy or goal is if you want to be wealthy, you have to move from the, this is my left, this is my left or right? All right, this is my right. You have to move from the right quadrant to the left quadrant. I told you I'm not that smart, right? You have to move to the left quadrant, which is the business owner. So your system is making money for you. You're making money in your sleep. So you've done something, you've set up something where irrespective of whether you're there or not, money still comes in. And I'm going to be sharing some of those ideas with you tomorrow. So he's saying that's where you want to be in. And then the last quadrant is the I quadrant, the investor quadrant which basically states that your money works for you, passive income. Now, here's what is very interesting. Most people will think that you need to go from the E to the S, from the S to the B, from the B to the I, but that's not true. Every single person that has a source of income can move directly from the E quadrant straight into the I quadrant. Why is that possible? What's the only requirement to do that? Income. You just need money. Anybody can become an investor. Anybody can start investing money into something provided that they have a source of income. And that is why I'm very confident that anybody can become wealthy. Right? But in order to get to this point, that goes back to the two things that we talked about. Spending less than you earn, saving a portion of your income so you can get into this quadrant. Make sense so far? Okay, great. All right. So you are either investing in liabilities or assets. So every time we earn any type of income, the money is going into two different buckets. All right? We looked at similar tree yesterday. You're either investing in liabilities or you're investing in assets. Liabilities, liabilities what does that look like? You know, constantly getting a new car, right? You, you, you love buying cars. I'm not saying there's not anything wrong with it, but I'm just telling you that anything that's not putting money into your pocket is a liability, all right? Clothes, shoes, material things, house. Now, this is also a big one because most people believe that their house is what? An asset. Is that true or is that false? Don't, don't, I mean, shoot out the answer. Right? Okay. False? Okay, some people, so it's 50-50, right? So here, here's what we need to fully understand. What is an asset? Something that puts money into your pocket. If you have a mortgage... Is it putting money into your pocket or taking money out of your pocket? Out of your pocket. Okay. Now, if you have a house and you rent out your basement, or you guys don't have basements here in Florida, or you rent out maybe a couple of rooms or whatever the case is, and you use that money to pay, off your, to pay your mortgage, is the house an asset? Absolutely. Right Now, a lot of people fight and argue about this, and I'm not here to debate. I'm just letting you know that the basis of considering something an asset is that it has to be something that puts money into your pocket. Right? So, yeah, you can consider your house an asset, the whole nine yards. That's great. Okay? Um, and then you can see from an asset standpoint, you have real estate, stocks, cryptocurrency, businesses, gold, silver, and so, much, you know, so many other things that you can invest in. So the whole goal is you want to find a way to get on the asset, um, asset side, right? So 
In doing that, and this is how people have conditioned their minds, people who are wealthy have conditioned themselves, is that you now take your cash flow from your asset to now invest or buy liabilities. Does that make sense? Okay, but people unfortunately do, do it the other way around where they invest most on liabilities and unfortunately nothing left to invest in assets. All right? So the number one secret to building wealth is patience. The number one secret to building wealth is patience because it's important to know that. Because most people, especially like young people, and we see it everywhere. Everybody wants to get rich when? Now. They want to get rich quick. They want to invest today and make $2,000, you know, 2,000% profit and this whole nine yard and all this kind of good stuff. And young people get into things that they shouldn't be getting involved with because they want that quick money. But one of the things that I respect so much about like Warren Buffett is that the stocks that he bought in the 40s and in the 50s, he still owns them today. And that's why he's one of the wealthiest people in the world. He owns a lot of companies today because he's been buying shares for over 40, 50 years ago. So if we're considering how do you become wealthy, we have to understand that, look, number one, wealth building takes time. And the younger you are, the more likely you are able to build wealth faster because time is on your side. Now, the older you are, the more aggressive you need to become because time is not so much on your side. Does that make sense? Okay. So Warren Buffett, of course, he says, the stock market is a device for transferring money from the impatient to the patient. Because what do you think happens? When, when somebody wants to get rich quick, they purchase a stock, all right? A stock starts going down. What do you think they do? They sell. But who do you think is buying? Patient people. Because every time somebody sells, somebody needs to be buying. Somebody is always buying. And if you're the person who's always selling and panicking when things are going down, you're far from the, the wealth spectrum. All right? So here's the power of investing. Just to kind of give you an idea of what's possible when you start investing early enough or when you're consistent with your uh, investment strategy. So assuming somebody earns $60,000 a year and they set aside 10%, that's $500 a month for investing, and they start at 30 years old, okay? In 30 years, meaning at the age of 60, if they consistently invested $500 every single month, by the age of 60, if they earn 8%, Average return over time, they have roughly about 745000 If they earn 10% over time, that's $1.3 million. Now, you might see it as a long time to make that kind of money, but do you realize that as I'm talking to you today, an average person who's close to retirement, cannot account for $150,000 that they can actually rely on at retirement. Because once again, most people think that, man, I don't have, man, I got all this time ahead of me. I'm still young. I got time. That's how people who are close to retirement was thinking. I got time. So if you don't start early, irrespective of your age, and start doing something today, time is going to catch up with you, right? Time is going to catch up with you. So I just wanted to show this to help you understand that little things done consistently over time will produce result, right? And we're not even talking about the market going up and down. We're not focused on that. We're just looking at what's going to happen if I did this on a consistent basis, all right? Let's see. Actually, I think I forgot a slide. All right. So, so for the rest of the time, we're going to look at about three different 
investment or wealth building strategies, which you already know, but I'm going to cover them again. So number one is stocks, all right? So why should you invest in stocks? Number one, you know, it's one of the greatest tools ever invented for building wealth. Every person that I know for the most part that has built some level of wealth did par partially or if not mostly by investing in stocks, okay? Um, you cannot work 24-7, but your money can, all right? And when you invest in stocks, what exactly does it mean to invest in stocks? You're buying a share of a company. What does it mean when you buy a share of a company? You own a piece of the company. I heard Warren Buffett say this a couple of days ago. He said, I don't buy stocks. I buy companies. It's a different mindset. Most people, yeah, I, want, I, I got this stock. No, no, no. I own a piece of that company. Even if you own one share, you own a piece of that company. So when you have that type of wealth mindset, you're not concerned about the fluctuation of the market. You are a business owner, right? If your business is not doing well, do you run off to sell the business? Yes, no? Nah. You do whatever it takes to build the business, to make sure things work. So when you invest in the right companies, they might go through challenges just like anybody's business would. But when you have a long-term vision, then you're not really moved by what's happening on a day-to-day -day basis. And that's Warren Buffett's philosophy. He said, I don't care if the price goes up or down because I'm buying I'm buying, you know, I'm owning a piece of the company. So he's more long-term, all right? And then, of course, compound interest. Raise your hand if you know how compound interest works. All right. How does it work, sir? Okay, yep, absolutely. So let me add to that. So compound interest, just to kind of give more meat to it, simply means that if you invested, say, $1,000, and you're earning 10% on your money, so year one, you earn 10% of $1,000, how much is that in year two? If you earn 10% on 1000 within a, one year, how much would you have in year two? 1,100, all right? So here's where compounding interest is so powerful. In year two, you're also earning 10%. Am I right? Because you're earning it every single year. But instead of earning 10% on $1,000, you're not earning 10% on what? 1,100. So in other words, you're earning interest on your initial principal, but you're also earning interest on your interest. So in year two, you're earning interest on $1,100, whatever that number is. In year three, now you now have, let's just say, $1,150. Now, compounding, the interest is now on $1,150. That number grows exponentially over time. And that's why people like Warren Buffett are extremely wealthy because they've been earning compound interest for over 10, 20, 30, 40 years. So if you understand compound interest, especially if you got kids and you're able to put away $50 every month for them, $100, they will not have to work by the time they become adults, depending on how much you're investing for them. Like my kids, I mean, I'm investing in everything from they don't really understand everything yet. But I know certainly that the only reason why they will be working a job is because maybe they love whatever it is that they want to do, but not because they need the money, right? And that's the importance of starting early, especially if you have young ones, all right? So here's some examples just to kind of help you understand how, you know, these growth take place. So look at Tesla. As of 2015, you can purchase one share of Tesla for $14.49. Okay, in 2023, as of maybe last week when I, when I uh, incorporate this slide, one share was $167. Now, before they did their stock split, this was during the peak of COVID, 
that one share went all the way to $1,000 and some change. So all you got to ask, if you bought just one share in 2015, we're, we're talking about just seven years ago, not even 20 years ago, and you bought 10 at $14.49, you do the numbers. So you see, when I tell you that, those who win in the game of investing are the people who have the ability to be patient, to watch their money grow, all right? You look at Apple, $32.37. You can get a share today. If, I mean, the same share cost, $172. Netflix, $64.87. I remember when Netflix first came out, right? Their shares was dirt cheap, okay? Now you see one share for Netflix, $339. So here's what you got to think about. What if you just purchase one today at 167 and you wait 10 years, 20 years, or you purchase one for your kid and you just let it sit there, you don't touch it, you don't look at it, and just wait 20, 30 years down the road? Patience. Somebody say patience. Amen. So as you're saving money, you know, this whole game of becoming wealthy it's not about get rich quick. It's not about get rich next month or next year. It's about consistently doing little over time and watching your wealth grow long term. All right? So just in case you want to have an idea of where to go, where can I start pur uh, purchasing stocks from, I, I personally use Charles Schwab and, and Vanguard, but most people use like um, Robinhood. Everybody heard of Robinhood? All right. I don't recommend Robinhood because it, it's designed and built for day trading, meaning that if you get into it, the, the likelihood of you starting to day trade is about 80 percent. OK, so if you see your stocks in there, you purchased it for a thousand dollars. Now it's at 500. It is very easy for you to click sell. Right now you see it going back up. Oh, now we're back to 700. Man, I shouldn't have got out. Very easy to click buy. And before you know it, you're dabbling into the world of day trading, and that's not good for those who are looking to build long-term wealth. Make sense? Okay. All right. So the third thing is cryptocurrency. Raise your hand have you heard of cryptocurrency. All right. What do you know about cryptocurrency? Huh? Digital currency? Blockchain technology? Huh? It's unregulated. It's getting regulated. Anybody in the back? Blockchain technology. So here's what I'll tell you. Um, and I'm not going to spend, well, I'll go with a few slides, but what I will tell you, all right, even though most people may not understand it, but believe me when I tell you, and I do know a little, I don't know a whole lot. This is probably one of the biggest wealth transfer of our time, um, even though most people don't understand it yet, okay? And I've been, I've been following the crypto space for over, uh, since 2016, so maybe eight years, and I've seen a lot of wonders, what, what it's done for people financially, but not necessarily you making out a lot of money, but understanding how blockchain technology works and how the world is eventually, as not eventually, has already started moving in that direction, right? Now we're talking about having a digital currency. Raise your hand if you heard of USDC. One, two, three, four, five. What is USDC? <laughs> Equivalent of the US dollar, right? So everything eventually is going to be digital. So when you understand that, you want to be ahead of the curve before everybody gets into it, all right? So, like most people have said, what is cryptocurrency, a.k.a. crypto? It's simply digital money that can be used as a medium of exchange, okay? Uh, so what do you need to know about crypto? Number one, it is spendable, right? Most people don't know that. For example, if you own Bitcoin, you can actually use Bitcoin to trade and make purchases in different parts of the world. All right, it is an asset. Institutional investors are now investing in it. All right, it's highly volatile, which most people are familiar with, meaning that you can put money into it, and let's say you put $100 in, tomorrow you can wake up, your $100 is $10. All right, you can also wake up, your $100 is $200. All 
But when you look at it from a long-term standpoint, you start to understand why patience is the key factor to building wealth. And I'll show you in one second. All right? And it can produce, produce massive gains in short, long period of time or long period of time. Uh, Bitcoin has emerged as an asset, alternative asset class, and the current circulating supply of Bitcoin is about 19.3 million out of 21 million. Who knows what that means? Yes, sir. Perfect. I mean, I don't think I could have said it better. Now, let me break it down so you can understand. If you understand the law of supply and demand, all right? And you know that there's a fixed amount of something, and everybody wants a piece of that something. What do you think will happen to that something? The price is going to be astronomical. Now, on the flip side, when we look at the dollar currency, all right, do, well, do you know that with just punching a few buttons, the United States government can print $1 trillion if they wanted to in one day. Supply and demand. Now, if you were me, would you prefer to have, to be holding something where they can print unlimited supply anytime they want and the value of it is going down or would you prefer to put your money into assets, not necessarily just crypto, that you know that the value will continue to appreciate. Which one? The second one. And that's what's happening to the dollar. Right now, the rate at which the dollar is losing its value, it's, it's growing rapidly fast. Meaning that whatever you could purchase a dollar with in, Mar in January, you can't get purchase the same thing with the same dollar in May. And you don't want to be holding a fiat currency. That's what paper money is, all right, fiat. And because anytime you can produce unlimited supply of something, the value must go down, all right? And that's why most people who are putting money into things like Bitcoin, cryptocurrency, is because they understand that there is a fixed amount of these digital assets, all right? It has become accepted uh, by mainstream media, serves as a hedge against inflation, and some companies are now using uh, coins like Bitcoin as part of their capital management strategy, all right? Altcoins. So altcoins are basically other cryptocurrency outside of Bitcoin. So as I'm talking to you right now, there are over 24,000 cryptocurrencies, all right? One Bitcoin, but 24,000 other types of digital assets, all right? And if you go on... Um, for those of you who might be interested in learning more about them, if you go to CoinMarketCap, you'll be able to see a plethora of these different coins and projects on there. Now, here's what's important. Look at the history of Bitcoin. All right? In 2010, how much was one Bitcoin? How many of you had nine cents in 2014? Okay. In 2021, so these prices are just based on the price at January 1st of each year from 20, 2010 to 2021. Do you know how much one Bitcoin peaked at in 2021? Somebody take a guess. Huh? $70,000 for one coin. All you needed was a dime in 2010 just to get one. Patience, time, and information, and knowledge, right? I had a friend in my MBA program. She was telling me years later, she said, Deepo, when we were in the MBA program, I heard, I didn't know about Bitcoin at that time. She said, I knew about Bitcoin. It was like 10 cents, but I didn't get it. I thought this was garbage, right? But once again, those who knew what it was back then, they bought thousands of them. Thousands of Bitcoin, right? So I'm sharing that with you to, to help you understand that sometimes you may not necessarily understand something, but it doesn't mean that it's not real and it's not working. So I'm sharing this with you, not to necessarily tell you, hey, go and buy Bitcoin, go and buy this coin, but I want you to be informed and start looking in that direction 
because I'm telling you, in the next coming year, so to kind of, and I'm not sure if this slide is up here. Let me see. Okay, I think I hit the slide, but there is what we call a, a market cycle, all right? And a market cycle basically means that we have, you know, the, down, the, the bear market and then we have the bull market. During the bull market, everybody's happy because everybody's making money. The prices of everything is high. Your portfolio is looking good. But during the bear market, nobody's smiling because your investments are down. It's, it happens in real estate, happens in stocks, happens in crypto, in any asset base. All right? Now, unfortunately, a lot of people lose money during the peak of the, ask the uh, bull market because we get excited when the price of everything is going up. So you know what happened in 2021 when Bitcoin was 70000 A lot of people started hearing about Bitcoin. So everybody was excited and people started getting in at the peak of the market. But you know, you want to know what happened at the peak of the market? People who bought during a bear market, they started taking profit during the peak market. So if you bought Bitcoin at, say, I don't know, $10,000, for example. Now, Bitcoin is 70000 When everybody starts pulling out, what do you think will happen? The prices go down because now only those who are not knowledgeable are buying at the peak. So here's why you should be excited, not just about cryptocurrency, but about the market as a whole. Where do you think we are right now? In the bear market. Nobody's buying and everybody's selling. So my question to you is, when do you think is the best time to buy? Now. Right? We're actually going to see lower and lower prices over the next couple of months because of what's going on in the economy. And that's why you need to make sure you are financially ready, just like Joseph and Pharaoh, to seize opportunities when they come. Because unfortunately, a lot of people will see it when it comes, but financially, they don't have it. So you can't be playing games right now, investing in things that are not producing any, you know, any income for you. You want to be getting your finances together, getting out of debt, saving money, looking for additional streams of income so you can build your financial capacity to seize opportunities when they rise. All right. And here's just a quick example, just a quick uh, comparison that if you bought Bitcoin in 2016, all right, at $430, Ethereum, which is the second cryptocurrency, $13, right? Talking about knowledge, the only thing I knew in 2016 was Bitcoin. I was looking at Ethereum when it was $8, but I was like, I don't care about Ethereum. I only care about Bitcoin. Now watch this, peaked at 70000 Ethereum peaked at 4000 That means in just five years, that's what happens in just five years. This is child's play compared to what's going to happen over the next 10 years, over the next 20 years. Because I'm telling you, blockchain is not going anywhere. Cryptocurrency is not going anywhere. All right? And these are just two out of over 24,000. But like, you know, like Dr. Hepburn said, you got to get the knowledge. You got to understand what they are, what are the right projects to invest in. You know, so as a rule of thumb, if you go to coinmarketcap.com, um, you'll see all the 24,000 lists of cryptocurrencies. And here's what I tell people. If you want to be on the safe side, stick to the one from, one, from the, top one, the top 50. All right? Because if you can make it to the top 50, out of 24,000, you're legit. Would you agree? Right? So instead of you kind of getting, like, confused, I don't know what to do, research the top 50, understand what the projects are about, right? And then, you know, if you decide to, you can um, put money into it. So who is investing in Bitcoin? Um, you know, people like Michael Slayer, you have Square, and, of course, you have Tesla and other institutional investors. All right. According to Newsweek, 
46 million Americans now own a piece of Bitcoin. Right? You don't even need a full Bitcoin. You just need a piece of it, right? You just need a piece of it. But more importantly, the other crypto projects will probably make people more money than Bitcoin itself, all right? Because you can see a lot more financial gains on those than you would on, um, on Bitcoin. Dr. Hebert, how, how much time I got left? I'm good? Okay. I'm good, everybody? You still with me? Yeah. All right, perfect. I think we can leave some time for you to ask questions. Sure, perfect. All right. So here's just some exchange. So he, these are the like the top exchanges if you are interested in learning where to get them from. So Coinbase is one of the largest in the world, same as Binance, and then the other three as well. Okay. All right. So I would recommend just probably stick with Coinbase and Binance. Those are the two easiest because you can connect your, your bank uh, account and all that good stuff. And you can also, like I talked about automation, you, if you want to do like $10, $20, and just kind of set it up on automation and forget it, you can do that as well um, on either one of these platforms. We're good? All right. All right, so how to buy, research what you're buying, invest periodically, and think long term. Because like I said, they are volatile. It goes up and it goes down. But if you're anything like me, we're not concerned about today. We're patient and looking at the, pot uh, the potential value in the future. All right, so the, the last thing I'm going to be talking tonight is life insurance as a wealth building strategy. Raise your hand if you know anything about life insurance. All right. What do you know about life insurance? You can be your own bank. It's my man. Okay. Who else? You got you have term, whole life. Okay. Which one is better, term or whole life? Whole life. Why whole life? can borrow against it. Man, you, they shot past the Hepburn. Yeah. <laughs> okay, you can borrow. How many of you knew that? Okay, almost everybody. Okay, so let's kind of go a little bit deep into this for those who don't know, right, and how to actually use it, all right? So the myth about life insurance for most people for the longest is that life insurance is only beneficial after you die. That is the general understanding of what life insurance is, that when I pass away, my, my significant other or my children will receive some type of payout upon my death, which is true, but it's not the full truth, all right? I always tell people that it's called life insurance, not death insurance, okay? Meaning that it's designed, certain policies are designed for you to be able to use them while you're still alive, while certain policies are only designed for after um, you pass away. Okay, so to give you more understanding for those who like to read, these are four powerful books that I believe will change anybody's mind as to how to view life insurance as a wealth building strategy. So it's not, it's bigger than just accessing money and borrowing money against it. It's how do you use it to actually build wealth, right? So all these four books, I've read them, very powerful books, right? You don't need all four, but Reading one of them would definitely give you insight as to how these um, types of policies work. We got this? All right. Okay. So talking about people who've used life insurance before. So the term YOLI is something that I actually coined. It doesn't exist. I just came up with it based on the other two terms that you'll see in a second. YOLI simply means your own life insurance. All right. Every single person that you see on here have used a cash value policy at some point to build something, to build a business, or to grow their wealth, okay? A good example, Walt Disney. How many of you know about how Walt Disney actually started? Yes, sir. Yes. Okay, awesome. 
Somebody, yes, sir. Yep. The whole, not, well, yeah, the cartoon, but the, just building the empire. How did he get the capital? Well, yeah, of course, because, yeah, it's on there, right? That was, a, that, was a, that was a not so smart question, right? So essentially, for those of you who read, maybe read about him, you understand that when he was looking to start out Disney, as we know today, no financial institution believed in his dream. None would actually extend a hand of loan to him to help him start what we know as Disneyland today. But fortunately for him, he had a cash value policy that he was able to borrow money from, and it was the funds from that policy that he was able to now leverage to now start what we know as Disneyland today. Okay? Uh, let's see. Who else? Waka Flocka. Everybody know Waka Flocka? Yeah. All right? If you know anything about him, you also know that he's a huge uh, uh, proponent of cash value policy. He no longer leverages the bank for anything. He keeps his money in his policy. When he needs it, he accesses his money. And I'm going to talk about why they actually do that. All right? And then Doris Christopher. How many of you know Doris Christopher? Okay. She's the founder of pa uh, Pamper Chef or something like that, right? She actually accessed money from her policy in the 80s, I think about $3,000 at the time, to start a business and later sold it to Warren Buffett for $900 million. And everything started from accessing and leveraging their policy. So when we talk about these policies, to me, we've gone, at least for those who understand it, it goes beyond just having life insurance so that way you can give something to your loved ones when you pass away. That's great, but how can you leverage it to be your own bank and also leverage it to invest in other income-producing assets? All right? Coley, corporate-owned life insurance. Corporations also use this same type of policy. All right? And then finally, bowling. And this is the one I want, to pay, I want you to pay most attention to. Bowling, banks, uh, uh, bank-owned life insurance policy. I didn't make any of this stuff up. It's not a hidden secret. They've been doing it for decades. You can Google it. It's right there. Right? That banks are putting billions of dollars into these policies. Bank of America, $21.3 billion. Wells Fargo, $20.5 20 .5 billion. Chase, 11.8. Citibank, $6.4 billion. Here's my question to you. Where do you think they're getting these monies from? Our deposits. Banks don't print money. Federal Reserve print money. Right? Banks only have money because we deposit money. So if you look at the three banks that have collapsed over the last three or two months, they collapsed simply because there was a bank run. Bank run simply means everybody went in and said, hey, we see some things that are a little bit shaky about this bank. We all want our money. So when everybody goes to the bank to pull their money out at the same time, that is the end of that bank. Right? So my question, my, my, I always ask people this, that if banks can put my money into an instrument, right, why can't I do the same thing with my money? All right? Now, let's take a little, a little bit deeper into this. FDIC, 53.4 of U.S. banks held some type of bully assets. Notice that they called life insurance an asset. I didn't, I didn't say this. You can actually look this up. Most people don't know that, especially within our community. Yes. People here, life insurance, nah, man, I'm trying to enjoy my money before I die. Sure, sure, sure. Right? I want to spend all my money. Sure. That's the mindset that we have, and we wonder why we're constantly passing down generational poverty because we're not taught principles. Wealthy people, they know the stuff. Right? They have policy for their kids. We talked about Rockefeller, how they, I mean, I don't even want to get into that. Right? When I start to understand how this thing works, all my kids got life insurance policy. Not because 
I'm thinking they're going to die because I understand that they can leverage this policy as a wealth building strategy. Not only for the cash value in the policy, but when they get older, now I transfer the ownership to them. They now make their kids the beneficiary. Right? And guess what? I'm teaching them that now so that when they get older, guess what they're going to do to their kids? They're going, that's how you build, that's how you transfer generational wealth. Education. Right? So, why do banks invest in Boley? Number one, it produces better return than traditional banks. Number two, growth in the cash value of the policy. All right, and I'm going to touch on that in a second. Number three, the death benefits are paid out completely tax-free. All right? Number four, low risk levels that fits into the bank standard investment criteria. The key word, low risk, and they're still able to get a return on their uh, the cash value. And finally, it helps to diversify the bank's investment portfolio. All right? So I want you to pay attention to this because I'm, I'm getting ready to wrap up soon. Fractional reserve. This is how the banking system works. When we go to the bank to deposit money, all right, by law, banks are only required to keep 10% of what we deposit on their books. All right, so you deposit 10,000, the law states they can only keep 1,000. The rest of the 9,000 got to go out into something. So you see, you deposit your 10,000 because you want your money to be safe. Right? The banks, and I don't know if you see this, I see sometimes you might get like every, like a dividend, maybe like 10 cents or 5 cents on your money, and I just laugh, right? They pay you 0.04% and sometimes nothing, but they take our money, and I'm not making this stuff up. You can leave here and just go on Google and look this stuff up. They take your money, and then they reissue our money back to us for mortgage, for car note, right, for your house remodeling, and they put part of it into life insurance, that's where that money comes from that I talked about the billions that they put into life insurance policies. So essentially, banks take our collective dollars and they redistribute it to earn a profit, but they don't pay us anything back. That's why I said earlier that banks are not in business to help to make us wealthy. They are in business to make money. So if you just want to save money, believe me, and I'm saying this like I'm very serious, you're better off taking that 10000 and just putting it under your mattress because you're saving money. <laughs> because the moment your money enters the system, it's used. It, it's used. Your, your money is not sitting there. Like if you log into your app right now, I don't know how much you got in your bank, and you see it, that's digital money. That's just numbers. Right? It's just numbers. So when you understand how the banking system works, you start to find different strategies to invest your money and make your money grow, right? So now, you've essentially given the bank free loan. <laughs> and they ain't giving us nothing. You're not getting nothing back. That, that's all we're doing. I mean, think about it. If I'm giving you money to hold for me real quick, you take my money, you earn 25%, I come back for my money, and you give me back the exact same money I give to you, what is that? That's a free loan, right? Now, watching the same example, okay? Somebody said the concept of being your own bank, and th this is how these cash value life insurance policies work. You can essentially open your own policy, all right? You're paying your premium, but they're designed to allow you to actually put in extra or lump sum of money. And you can now take that money that you put into the policy and ask, and ask for a loan from that money. Now, the question I often get asked is, why would I want to take out a loan against my money? Why would I want? Here's the reason why. 
because when you, let's say you put in $20,000, you go back in, hey, I want to take $10,000. Your $10,000 never truly leaves the account. The life insurance company will loan you $10,000 while your twenty dollars is still there earning uninterrupted compound interest. So the way it works is that when you take out a loan, the idea is you pay yourself back so you have more money to access in the future. But if you don't pay yourself back, all the insurance company is going to do is when you pass away, they simply just deduct the loan they gave you from whatever is left in there. That's the whole concept of being your own bank, that you have your money that's constantly revolving, earning uninterrupted compound interest while you're able to use the same dollar to invest in other income-producing assets. So when you see wealthy people talking about, yeah, I have, you know, I'm, let, I'm using, I have a whole life policy, you know, blah, 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 it's not because they really need the death benefit. Because would you agree that if you have millions in your account, you really don't need a policy? Would you agree? But when you understand the power of something like this, then it's a different conversation, right? All right, so what are the benefits of a cash value policy? Number one, the death benefit pays out. That's what I call generational wealth. If you have a million-dollar policy, you pass away, that gets passed on to your children, your spouse. Do you agree that their lifestyle will be a little bit different? Yes. Provided that you've taught them how money works, right? And here's a question I want to ask you. How different would your life be today if your grandmother left you a million dollars? Would you be in the church right now? Well, that's, that's, well, if you knew this church then, yes. But what I'm saying is, your lifestyle will probably be a bit different and the course that you would have taken in life might be different from where you are today, right? So for me, when I think about that, I think about not just my kids, I think about future generations. And that's why I teach my kids about money today because I know if they can get it, yeah. um, it's a wrap, right? My grandkids, they'll, they'll be kissing my forehead like my, my picture, man, thank you, granddaddy, Right? So that's the beauty of it. So number two, the cash value earns an average interest of 4 to 10%. So meaning that whatever money you're putting into the policy is actually earning 4 to 10% interest, right? And that's why a lot of people leverage these types of policies. It's not impacted by the market, right? So unlike stocks, cryptocurrency, that if, it, you know, if anything happens, it goes down, whatever money you put into these policies irrespective of what happens in the market, you never lose the value of your dollar. So you only benefit from the upside of the market, not the downside of the market. So you have protection, okay? And then you can leverage the cash value to invest in other income-producing assets. That's the key, right? The key is accessing money to invest in other income-producing assets you pay yourself back into the policy so when other opportunities come around, you have money to leverage again. Does that make sense? Yes. All right? And then, of course, you have things like pay for college tuition and also supplement your retirement income tax-free. All right? So I'm getting close to the end, and we can ask questions. So three retirement strategies. So there are people who actually use this policy as a means to supplement their retirement. And here's why. So when you look at 401k, which traditionally, that's what most people are familiar with, all right? That's their primary strategy for retirement. The maximum you can put into a 401k as of 2023 is 20500 You get the employer match, but however, there are restrictions on when you can withdraw. So if you go in to touch the money before 59 and a half, you're penalized yeah. on your money. All right? It's impacted by the market. And to me, this, that's the most dangerous part. Right? You're saving for retirement. But your savings is hinged on the fact, on the hope, that the market will continue to go up. Right? If the market goes down, God forbid, on the year that you want to retire, 
Forget about retirement. You don't have to believe me. Just ask people who experienced in 2008. You don't have to believe me. Ask people who experienced in 2020 when COVID hit and they wanted to retire. And it put, the entire portfolio took a 20, 30, 40% hit. That, that does a lot of damage to your, to your, to your soul. Mm-hmm. Right? Because you say, think about it. All your life you've been putting money away yep. in a 401k that's been going up and down with the hope that when you get to a certain age, you can retire, right, have peace of mind, and all of a sudden, due to something that you have no control over, the market takes a hit. And that, to me, I don't, I don't play around with this stuff right here, all right? Same thing with IRA, the cap is 6,500, but when you look at LERP, LERP simply means life insurance retirement plan, right, using the same policies. You can put in any amount of money you want into the policy. You, there is no cap, depending on how the policy is structured, right? You can access your money anytime you want. There is no restriction, okay? It's not impacted by the market, all right? You have long-term care. Here's what that means. That means if you have a million-dollar policy, and God forbid you become critically, terminally, or chronically ill, the life insurance company will allow you to access 80 to 90% of your death benefit while you were still alive. Right. Where I'm not even talking about the cash value, the death benefit. So when you, look, when you compare all three of these from, a, I guess, a retirement standpoint, it's, it's a no-brainer, right? And here's what the inventor of 401k had to say, right? He actually said this, that he believed that he created a monster. Because what 401k was designed to do when it was first uh, uh, introduced in, I think, in 1970-something, it's not what it's doing today. But yet, people are still up doing what people who were in the 70s were doing in 2023 when the game has changed. Because of lack of knowledge. Lack of knowledge. Right? I'm not saying don't put money to your 401k. I'm just saying you have to be well informed. And let me see if this video will actually play. Uh, okay, it'll play, but the audio. We look into the fees that people pay at 401k. Okay, and the perfect. Fact that most Thank people you. People don't even know that they pay a fee. This is the most amazing thing. It's a $4.4 trillion industry that for 30 years, they didn't have to tell you what they were charging you. Only three years ago, the Department of Labor changed the rules and said, you've got to tell people what you charge them. So now they do that by giving a 35 or 50 page disclosure document that if you have a PhD in finance, maybe you can figure out the hidden fees. So here's what you have to know. Most people, 58% of the people don't even think there are any fees. Mm -hmm. I did a three core messages for your viewer. One, fees matter and you're paying them. A 1% in fee, because of the compounding over time, costs you 10 years of retirement income. The average person thinks they're paying less than 1% or nothing, and they're paying 3.1%. That's 30 years of fees. So I'll give you an example. If you have a 35-year-old person, they have $100,000, and they put it in the market, and they let it compound for 30 years till they're going to retire, and they're paying 1% in fees, they have $761,000, which is a nice growth Mm -hmm. from that time. But if you paid 3% in fees for the same stocks, you have $432,000. So in other words, you have 76% more money if you have less fees. Or in the other view, you have 19 years less income. So people don't understand that fees matter. The second thing they don't know is that the funds matter. Where would you want to put your money? Most people are not stock experts. No, I know. It's like Greek to a lot of people. It's totally. So what do you do? Let someone else tell them, which is a disaster. So I interviewed Warren Buffett. I interviewed uh, David Swenson, who took Yale from $1 billion to $24 billion, the smartest minds in the world. And they all say, you're never going to beat the index. In fact, 96% of all active mutual funds will never be able to match the index over any 10-year period of time. So 4% make it. Now, some of you say, I'm going to find the 4%. Uh, Good luck. Essentially, there, there, there are a lot of things that most people are not aware about when it comes to what they're putting their money in, right? And if you understand what I said yesterday, that the biggest difference between those who are wealthy and those who are not is that keyword financial literacy, mm-hmm. right? Anything that you're putting your money into, you have to understand how it works. And unfortunately, you know, things like 401k is one of those vehicles that people have zero clue. 
Like, they don't know what stocks, what stocks they're investing in, what mutual fund. They don't even know they're being charged all these fees right. and how that's being deducted from their real retirement income. So, you know, as I conclude tonight, because this is where I'm stopping at before we get into questions, is we got to go. If you missed yesterday, please go back and watch the entire session to understand the importance of, you know, you being informed. Right, understand understanding the importance of financial literacy, and then finally, like when you look at what we talked about today, you may not be able to take action on ninety percent of the stuff that I talked about, but just do something. Just do one thing. Somebody say, do one thing. Do one thing. Right. And that one thing that you do can now spark you in that journey of at least moving in the direction of building wealth. Okay. So at this point, I'm pretty much done. Um, I guess we're gonna. Come on, y'all, let's clap our hands. Let's stand on our feet and clap our hands, y'all. How many of you enjoyed tonight? Pastor Elliot, something on your face. Look on the face, up or out. Monica, you'll be seated. If anybody have any questions, come and get anybody have any questions. Any questions, come now. Any questions that's crossed your mind, anything that came to your mind, come, come, um, come on up. Come, Pastor Lockhart, hold the mic for me, so when people come, you can give them the mic. And there's no silly questions, let me say that. There's no silly questions, so come. Somebody just stand on that side with the mic, yeah, right? Which side? Hi, good evening. Hey, good evening. Um, my question is, if you borrow on these life insurance policies you have, do you pay interest, and who is the interest paid to? Great question. So, yes, so it depends on the, well, there are different types of ways to access money, right? If you're doing like a fixed, um, a fixed loan, right? So they usually do what we call a wash, meaning that they might charge you 3% or 4% on that loan, but then again, they will credit you 4%, right? But if you're doing like a variable interest, which to me is more preferable, this is where you're actually, your money stays in your cash value, but they're loaning you, quote, unquote, their money. So they may charge you, let's say, 5%, right? But your money is earning an average of 7 to 10% in any given year. So you have the spread of, I don't know, like 3 to 5%, you know, interest on that money. So that's pretty much how it works when it comes to the access and loan from the policy. Did I, did I answer your question? Okay. Hey, how's it going? Uh, thank you. Um, so I just want to know from you know, your perspective the difference between a trust and life insurance and which one's better or, you know. Sure. So <laughs> um, it's not which one is better. So trust is basically a way to protect your asset. That's pretty much what it is, right? Because most, most of the time when people pass away, if they don't have a trust, they have to go through probate, and that can take very long time, and then the government gets to decide how your asset is being allocated the whole nine yards. So trust is basically something that you get to put all your assets in, and then you now determine as a trustee what happens and who gets what uh, you know, from your assets, right? So from a life insurance standpoint, like some of our clients, because I, I, um, I run a, uh, what do you call it? a life insurance agency, some of our clients would get life insurance and then put their life insurance inside their trust, right? And then they also put like their homes and things like that. So that if anything happens, forget probate, every, like the instructions are already in the trust on who gets what and all that good stuff. Answer your question? Awesome. Thank you for all the information. My question is about the getting rid of debt portion of yep. the So if you've built up a, let's say, a good amount of savings, would it be best to use, okay, he said no silly questions. Sure. Right. Would it be best to use some of that savings to pay down the debts that you have or simply leave that savings alone and now just focus on debt with your income? Like if I say you've built up a good amount of savings so that way it's like, you, you have the ability to pay the debt, sure. but you're just like, well, I don't want to touch my savings. So, I, I, would, I would knock out that debt ASAP. Because think about it. Your saving is not earning anything, right? Is, am I right? No. It's, okay. it's in a, a money market. 
It's in a safe. Uh, how, how you, how you safe you, is Okay, right, perfect. But, okay, well, that's right. good. But I think for me, like, I want, you might not want to dump everything on the debt, but I would say pay off a reasonable amount, and then as your income starts to come in, then you're tackling everything else, right? But per personally, I, I just I just don't like debt. So whatever I got to do to get rid of it so I can be debt free and then start building from there, you know, I would do that. Okay, thank you. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for what you shared today, yes, tonight. But my question has to do with you were talking about investing in Bitcoins. And I'd like to know. What would you say about those that would like to uh, invest in gold or silver? Is that a good option? Yeah, absolutely. Um, that's actually one of the things that I, I'm also, uh, you, you know, building my wealth around in precious metals. So gold and silver are definitely like uh, something you must have in your portfolio, right? So if you're not too rich, like, you know, if you're not a huge risk taker and you just don't like the volatility, Definitely, gold and silver is definitely a great option as well, certainly. And if you're looking, if you want to know where to get them from, um, usually if you go on like Google and type in like gold, silver, whatever, sometimes you might have like dealers around your, you know, where you live. But from an online base, if you go to goldsilver.com, um, you'll be able to purchase it from there as well. Thank you for all this information, great information. Um, okay, so the life insurance, um, where, do you, where do you suggest to get it? And then is the life insurance and the life insurance retirement policy like two different things? No, it's just the terminology, right? The LERP life insurance retirement plan? Yeah. Yeah, it's the same thing as, it's just a term for those who want to use it to supplement their retirement, but it's still the same, same policy. Okay. And then where do I, where do I look for that one? Because you gave us like different places for everything, but I didn't catch, I didn't catch that one. Yeah. So you can certainly go on. Like, so my agency actually helps clients who want specifically that type of policy. But if you wanted to learn more, you can certainly go online and things like that. Um, great companies to look at, like Nash, uh, Misha of Omaha. They've been around for over 100 years. National Life Group been around for over 175 years. So these are like real reputable companies that, um, that are specifically geared towards those who are looking for, we call them IULs. Okay, so my question is um, about the cash value life insurance policy. Sure. There's um, whole life, um, variable, and what's the other? Universal. Index universal life. Yeah. So which one would you say would be the better one? So whole, whole life is great. So some whole life policy, I won't say all whole life, your normal whole life policy is not really built for building cash value. But if it's a mutual-based whole life policy, then it allows you to do that. Uh, but most people don't usually go with that because you got to have, if you're trying to use it for like being your own bank, you need a reasonable size of money to actually put into it. Variable life, I don't recommend that because essentially what they're doing is that they're taking your cash value and investing it directly into the market. So that means if the market goes down, then your cash value also goes down with it. While index universal life is not necessarily invested into the market, so it doesn't move with the volatility of the market. So you, you're better off getting a better protection on index universal life than variable universal life. Thank you. My pleasure. Did that help? Did that help? Yes. Hi. Um, so my question is with the leverage high value yield savings account. Yes. So the APY is the interest. Is it the same like the interest that we pay, like credit cards? Like we have to pay like four percent. Is the four, is the APY the interest that they pay you for letting your money stay in the account? Yes, correct. Okay. Okay. Yep. That was a very easy question. 
So you said you need a reasonable amount of money to invest in the life insurance policy to utilize it as your own bank in future. What would be a reasonable amount in that world? Well, so I think re reasonable is relative, right? Because we have people who actually get these pots. They all they have is ten thousand dollars. They put it in. They have five thousand. But it has to be structured a certain way to help you get the kind of results that you want. Um, but for people, so we have also clients who use it for real estate deals, right? So rather than just using their, you know, the money in their account for their real estate deal, they put it into the policy, fifty, hundred grand, and then they borrow against it and then use it for that. So it really all depends on where you are financially that determines how it's built. So essentially any amount can be put in, but if you're going to see good results, then, you know, you have to put in something reasonable. Like 20000 plus. Correct. Yeah. We need goals, right? Yeah, absolutely. So let me also say this. You don't have to start out with that. You can start the policy. So you can start with $200 a month just to get the policy up and running. As time goes on, you come with you know, extra cash, then you put $500, $1,000. You can start off that way as well. So you don't necessarily have to start the policy like right now and then put in a lump sum. So that way, you know, people are not discouraged and thinking that you need all this money to actually get it started. Yep. Um, as she was speaking about the yield accounts, it uh, just rang something in my mind. Uh, there's a... Um, a company that I looked up, I don't know if you've heard of them, called Interactive Broker um, Brokers. They have an APY of 4.58%. Um, I wanted to know, if you say you, never, you haven't heard of it, but yeah. I wanted to know what your, what your take on it was. No, I've never heard of them, but I mean, any, the, essentially, you can research any company online just to kind of understand where they are, what, they, you know, what they're into, and then if it makes sense, then you know, essentially do it, but... You know, the ultimate goal is to put your money into something that's giving you more returns than traditional banks are. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I have two questions, both about the compound interest. Okay. Um, you were talking about how we can put money into savings or different investments that pay us compound interest. Yeah. So I was wondering what types of accounts pay compound interest as opposed to regular interest? So, all right, let me clarify. So interest is interest, right? The, the, the compound interest uh, idea is that you're earning money on top of the interest that you earned the previous year, okay, right? So it's not necessarily like this company's paying compound interest. Interest is interest. You're just, the longer you leave your money in there, the more you're earning, quote unquote, compound interest. Okay, and then they, when they charge us interest, it's the same thing? When we take out a loan, uh -huh. then the compound interest is the same? Or is there some loans that are different? Because somebody told me once to never take out a home equity loan because it, like, never gets paid off because of the compound interest. Yeah, so, we're, yeah, so you're either paying out compound interest or you're receiving compound interest. Always. Right. It's always, always. compounded. Correct. Okay, thank you. My pleasure. Thank you for all the information. Um, with the high yield accounts, I have uh, two high yield accounts, and I noticed that, like you said, um, with patients, you can, like I use them to borrow my own money, because before I used to, you know, maybe go to a cash, uh, cash loan place or to the bank. So I started putting, putting little money in them, and then uh, I think I had uh, like a deposit of $25 every pay period. Oh, that's love. And after one year, I checked it, and I started rolling over a little extra money, a little mm. extra money, and I looked, and I was like, $5,000? Where did that come from? Wow. So this one um, high yield had a high interest rate, uh, a high uh, return rate. And, but after COVID, it dropped, along with all the other ones. They dropped down really, really low. I think it was like seven. Then it dropped down to four, and now... Um, it's still like four, but then I researched and saw some that had a higher yield. Do you suggest switching over or just staying until um, maybe it increased later? Or if if there's one out there that has higher yield, I will move it over because you're not, you know, it's really it's a savings account, right? So it's almost like you're moving money from Bank of America to Wells Fargo. So I would definitely do that. One more 
question about sure. the high yield account. Because in my head, I'm like, all right, they borrowing for us. What happened? They can't pay us back. So, like, what's the risk of it? Well, so most of them are financial institutions, right? So if you look at Apple, for example, Apple really doesn't need our money. They're worth over a trillion dollars, right? So you're looking for institutions that are reputable to put your money into. So to me, I think if you look into, like, the five that I mentioned, you just – you know, look at it, which one makes sense, look at their track record, and then you put your money into it. And most of them are also FDIC insured as well. So you're good. So as long as you're not putting in more than 250000 I mean, even if, they, even if they become insolvent, your money's still protected. Yeah. So, um, this is like a tech stack question. So are you using any data aggregators like Mint, uh, QuickBooks to help with the, I guess, automating your finances, or do you recommend any other apps or tools that we can use? Um, so, I mean, I only use QuickBooks for, like, my payroll. Um, that's pretty much it. But now, is that related to, like, your personal finance, you mean? Or yeah, so I... I'm an Excel guy, so I have an actually I have an Excel spreadsheet that has all my bills, exactly how much money I pay every month, so I know how much is coming out of my account every single month, and that's how I usually keep track of my expenses. But things are more technical now, so you can download apps and things like that to actually make it a lot easier. So it really depends on whatever works for you. Uh, do you do your own forecasting, or do you just kind of? I guess look at how your, I guess your stocks and stuff are performing on like, I guess on the website. Yeah. I just pay attention to the cycle. So I'm not the type of person that will go in, oh man, it's down a day and nah, I just leave it. But I understand like the investment cycle and I know that right now we're in a bear market. So I dollar cost average. So dollar cost average simply means that if you buy stock or crypto A at $100 today and then it drops to say, $75 tomorrow, I'm going to buy more at $75 because now it's cheaper. So when the price start to go up, I'm able to recoup my money faster and be more profitable because I was buying every time, <clears throat> every time the prices went down. Does that make sense? Okay. Amen. Awesome. Let's clap our hands. Y'all give God a praise. <laughs> was that helpful? It's a lot of knowledge. He is full of knowledge. Come here for me. Come here. I, I, have, I have a question. You were saying that the value of the dollar, the paper dollar, is going down. So it'll be a good time to invest in, like, bitcoins or gold or... Absolutely. Everybody heard that? Yeah. Everybody? Go ahead. Anything to retain the value of your money is what you want to invest in. So obviously, like gold and silver are great tools to actually retain, you know, the value of money. If you're not really in, you know, very, if you're not a risky person, I would definitely settle for gold and silver. Silver, because it's more affordable for everybody. I right. think it's like $50 per uh, bullion coin, uh, while uh, gold is around $2,000 and some change. Wow. Let's stand on our feet, y'all. Well, tonight is just, a, it's like a class, <laughs> like you're in school, and it's a lot to know. It's a lot to understand and to know, but knowledge is power. My people perish because of what? N lack of knowledge. It's so good to understand all of this and get greater insight. How many of you, how many of you agree with that? Lift your hands to heaven. I, I appreciate the knowledge, I, and not just the knowledge, but even, even the ability to, to get more wealth. I believe God wants to bring us in a wealthy place. But when you don't know these things, you don't know how to invest properly. Somebody say amen. amen. So I believe some things, it's, but the knowledge is there for us to know. And I think we need to, to one of, what, what is happening tonight is God is putting the platform for us to get the knowledge so we can invest properly as he transfers, transfers the wealth. Is that right, y'all? Let's take a step tonight. Let's take a step forward. Father, we thank you tonight for everything. Let's get ready. Prepare our hearts. Lift your hands to heaven. I believe. I believe. Somebody say Bishop believes. I believe the greatest investment we can make on earth is in the kingdom. Don't just say amen to be excited. I believe it's 
important to understand everything that he is saying because we don't want to be so kingdom minded we're not that we are no earthly good does that make sense to anybody but i believe that every because our investment in the kingdom is eternal so i say amen how many of you believe that how many of you have lost investing in the kingdom how many of you gain investing in the kingdom you only look sure how many of you have gained investing in the kingdom? Yes. But I believe that God wants to bring us to a greater place of wealth. Yes. Y'all believe that? Yes. And a greater place of wealth is not just living from paycheck to paycheck, but being able to be in a wealthy place where we're supportive of our own debt freedom. How many of you would like to be debt free in the name of Jesus? Oh, no mind anything. Travel where you want to travel. Buy what you want to buy. Live where you want to live. And be a blessing to the kingdom of God. Yes. Amen? Amen? Does that make sense to anybody? How many of you believe that if you were dead free, you would have a lot of less headaches? Step forward. <laughs> How many of you believe if you could do more, you could have, if you could do more for the kingdom, it takes money to be able to do more for the kingdom? Is that the truth, y'all? Hallelujah. Y'all ain't sound sure. But for those of us that are sure, we know that God's going to bring us into a wealthy place, and we know that Depot is here by the will of God teaching us strategies, teaching us to understand and keep us on the right track. Somebody say, in the name of Jesus. Because America is going through a, de a, a recession, y'all. It's coming, or some say it's already here. But we want to be able to stand while this is going on and make it through these times. Like when Joseph was able to, and Pharaoh in Egypt was able to make it through the times. But God has given us wisdom. God is shedding knowledge and understanding so that we could know how to do it. Amen? I was sitting there saying, man, this young man has so much wisdom in the area of wealth. It's amazing. We thank God for it. Clap your hands one more time. Give God a praise. And he's sharing it. And what he's doing, he's not keeping it. That's very key, y'all. He's not keeping it to himself. He is sharing it. How many of you know it's good to share it? When you're able to share it, amen, that helps us, to be, that empowers us, y'all. So what he's doing is he's empowering us tonight. And I appreciate that in Jesus' name. You may be seated. Let's get ready to give our best to the Lord tonight. Let's give on. That's right. Clap your hand. Let's get ready to give our best to the Lord. So good, so good, so good. When you borrow from life insurance, is it better than borrowing from the bank? Because you don't have to pay as high interest. I'm asking from your life insurance. Do you, you get my question? If you borrow from your life insurance, is it better to borrow from your life insurance than to borrow from a bank? If you have it in the, because you because you pay less in the interest, exactly. it's like you borrowing from you. You become your own bank. Okay. How many of you in here don't have life insurance? Get life. So what you learn tonight? You, you learn tonight that life insurance is important. It's not just something that you can get when you die. It's something that you can borrow from. That's right. You can borrow from it now. You become like your own bank. I think what is important, Monica, and, the, and I'm not sure, I got a little confused. Yes, a little bit, not by you, but just understanding. The best insurance to have is whole life insurance or, you say, as I heard, whole life variables and indexing. What is the best one to have or they vary it really all depends on what, you're trying to save. what if you're trying to save money or borrow money index you know see we're not told that all we tell told is universal or get I mean all we're told is to get insurance but we're not and then we go out and we buy insurance but we're not told which one is the best one to get and I think it's good to know that you can borrow from it and you can invest your money in it. So you said variable index. It's the best. No, no, no. What's the best one? I wouldn't choose variable index. Which one to do? Index universal life. Index universal life. Write that down. Index universal life is the best insurance to have if you want to build the maximum cash value and then to be able to borrow from it. I, th I would recommend everybody getting that one. That's the one I would recommend getting. 
Anybody want to add to that? Don't just let me be up here and y'all got ideas too. Hakeem, you want to say something? Come. Yeah, come on. You can talk on the mic. So he's saying, I'm telling you as your leader, as your who? Get the one you can build cash value. Am I saying that right? Depot? Yeah. <laughs> get the one you can build cash value in and the one you can borrow from. Honey, got to write that down. Build the one you can get, build the cash value in, and the one you can borrow from. And what's the name of it? Y'all will learning, y'all will learning, we're learning. Y'all better get this. Because you're building cash value and you can borrow as we want to write that down. So if anybody comes knocking on your door for life insurance, what kind of life insurance are you going to get? Index universal life. Index universal life. And why are you going to get that? Because you can build cash value. You don't have to wait till you die and leave it for somebody. You can borrow from it if you need money from it. And it builds cash. Does that make sense? Don't just say yes because I'm the bishop. So real quick, for anybody who's interested in learning more, I can, I can, my company can work not for you but with you to help you get in the not policy yet, structure. Um, <laughs> no, 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 because I've, I've, I've seen people say, you know, where should I go? You know, so I, I know, not yet though. Not yet. We want to we want continue to build a relationship with you. We, what we will do first is we're going to, we, before you do that, you want to see me. <laughs> Amen? We want, we still build in relationship. Does that make sense? Yeah. I just wanted to know how long, um, how long you got to pay into the policy before you go, before you can start to pull money in our money. Um, it depends on how you fund it. Right, some people are able to access money within a year, um, sooner. Some people five years. So if you're not putting in anything um, substantial and you're just doing like a monthly payment, then obviously it takes a little bit longer for you to be able to access something from it. You got that, Akeem? What did he say? Tell me what he said. Tell me what he said. So depending on how you fund it, in terms of the time when you can take out and, and pull it in, uh, when you put the, the time that you I get what he's saying. Like, I don't well, like to talk in front of those people. Yeah, make sure he get it. What is he doing? Like, depending on how you deposit the money determines how you can pull it out. Right. Basically, right. what you're saying. Right. Yeah. Very good. We got to make sure we clear on this. We got to make sure we clear. I won't be clear. How many of you won't be clear tonight? We, we are continuing to grow and learn. And we, I won't get this right. I've never heard of an index universal insurance policy ever. And so, and so I'm wondering, like, do all companies offer that or I'm, I'm, I've never heard of it ever. Is it a part of the insurance policy, every insurance policy? No. So there's certain companies that offer that? Correct. And there's certain companies that you offer term policies, right? So you got to, know. yeah. But if you want to just find out companies, if you go on Google and you'll be able to find some, but the most important thing about these policies is not necessarily you get in it, but how it's structured. Because if it's not structured the right way based on what you're trying to accomplish, then you can certainly be put money away, but you're not building anything because of the way the agent might have designed it for right. you. Right. That's very true. That's very true. Taki, you have a question? Come. We can't. You got to come get the mic. We're about to close, y'all. We're about to close. This is good stuff. We got more coming tomorrow night. Um, I have a question as a um, business owner. Um, so I have the, the access to be able to offer health and 401k plans for employees. So based on how you broke that down, it sounds like that's not a good situation <laughs> for me to be able to offer 401k to my employees so what can i offer them to be able to you understand what i'm yeah, saying yeah, yeah, yeah. because many what can you substitute to be able to have people work for you as a business owner because you want to be able to offer people something that they want to stick with you because most yeah. of the companies that's what they do so i'm not saying don't invest in 401k at all that's not what i was saying right i'm just saying that people need to understand what happens yeah what happens with the put money in the 401k they can actually pick you know what they invest in it so they need to understand all those nuances um but at the same time also consider having a retirement supplement in addition to their 401k 
right? So as an employer, you can certainly still do that because if you're not offering anything of value to the employees, the chances are they may not stay long enough, right? So you can do that, but also let them know about maybe having a Roth IRA, for example, right? Um, so, so know. but is there an alternative to have besides the 401k? Is what she's asking. Roth IRA, right? Um, but as an employee, I think some employees are also able to match up to a certain amount with like IRA or Roth IRA. So that's something you could possibly look into as well. Um, and then obviously I talked about alert, but as an employee, you may not feel comfortable talking about that. But stick with 401k, but also offer them the option of doing, you know, Roth IRA, certainly. Let's stand on our feet, y'all. Somebody bring me an envelope, please. Good stuff. Good stuff. Good stuff. Good stuff. Good, good stuff. Amen. Tell somebody good stuff. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Point your hands at your seed. Hallelujah. Let's point our hands at our seed. Oh, we bless you, Lord. We honor you, God. We thank you, God, in the name of Jesus for the wisdom and the knowledge and the understanding. Father, we thank you, God, for the insight you've given us. Father, teach us how to apply it rightly, God, and give us, Lord, lead us. Somebody say, Lord, lead us. Continue to lead us and guide us into all truth, O oh God. Father, help us to be faithful to what you've given us. And God, what you want to transfer to us, Father. Lord, we believe in our hearts, our minds, you want to give us so much more. Teach us how to be faithful, O oh God. Lord, in the name of Jesus, thank you for, for allowing Debo to come and give us, Lord, the wisdom and the insight to think more, to go deeper into our finances, oh God, so that we can do more for the kingdom. If you hear me tonight, take a step, God, so we can be more and do more. Lift your hands high. Father, we thank you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth for blessing this offering. Sanctify it, oh God. Enlarge our territory, Father. In the name of Jesus, bring us into debt freedom. Don't we always pray for debt freedom, y'all? Do we pray for debt freedom with every offering? And then God is sending someone with the strategy on how to be debt free. Let's clap our hand and give God praise for that. He's hearing us. He's hearing us. Oh, y'all ain't clapping like y'all excited. He's hearing us. With the heart to do it. Come on, take a step forward. Father, bless the meal tonight. Bless the food we're about to partake. Bless the hands and prepare it, oh God. Father, we thank you in the name of Jesus. Let the word find good ground. Father, lead us to the right places so we get the right answers, oh God. Father, help us not to be caught off guard with the times that we're in. Father, whatever is coming to this planet, help Jump Ministries to be a, ahead of it, God. Even as you protect God, Egypt, protect this church and the body of Christ. Those of us that are planted, God, let our, let our barn always be filled. Let, let it never grow empty. Mm, God, you'll lift your hands, your Father, we honor you tonight. Thank you for how you provided. Thank you for your continual provision, Father. Lord, we ask in the name of Jesus Christ for the blood of Jesus to be over our finances. We break every word curse. We break every psychic prayer. And Lord, we thank you for wisdom. We thank you for knowledge. Teach us how to be great investors. Mm, man, one person. That's right, Tamala. Teach us how to be great investors. So, God, there will be continual income, Father. Somebody say, in the name of Jesus. Let's clap our hand and give God praise, y'all. Let's clap our hand and give God praise. I believe, hallelujah. Tell somebody, hallelujah. hallelujah. Come on, shout hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on, shout hallelujah. hallelujah. With this miss from this place, not his presence. Grab somebody neck, let him know you love him.
Get connected with Jump Ministries Global Church. Be sure to follow us on your favorite social media networks and never miss out on our bi-monthly men and women's prayer services, our youth events and activities, our global outreach and community celebrations, our competitions, conferences, or even just to get that one word to encourage you. Just visit jumpministries.org. Building people, changing lives, and on the move. Joyously unveiling the master's plan. Discover your faith. Experience Jump Ministries Global Church. So if you go to the wrong people for comfort, they can keep you in your condition. Building people. Changing lives. And on the move. Jump Ministries Global Church.